I'd like to make a statement to the Assembly regarding my major capital works investment plans in the coming period. In my statement to the House on the 5th of May 2020, I announced an investment of around 40 million across 16 schools under the School Enhancement Programme. My focus today is on major capital works projects that I have approved to advance in design. But before I announce these projects, I would first like to provide the House with a brief update on the Department's current capital works programme. My Department is responsible for the planning, management and delivery of a fit-for-purpose schools estate that will provide a first-class education experience for pupils, staff and wider uh, school communities and help our young people fulfil their potential. The school's estate is wide and diverse, spread across five sectors, with an even broader management uh, authority base. There are many challenges in managing such an estate, not least of which is the need to balance the limited capital resources that I have uh, available to me against the much-needed capital investment in our schools. It is therefore essential that any capital investment is targeted at supporting the delivery of modern, fit-for-purpose schools that are both viable and sustainable into the future. Mr Speaker, since 2012 there has been a total of 66 projects announced under the Major Capital Works Programme. 26 of these projects are now complete, 8 are currently on site, 12 are in the design phase, 11 are at business case preparation stage and one is on hold. In addition, 76 projects are currently being progressed under the School Enhancement Programme and a further 27 major capital uh, projects are being pr progressed under the Fresh Start Programme. In terms of capital budget, uh, Mr Speaker, I have agreed a provisional budget of £40 million for the Major Capital Works Programme and the School Enhancement Programme in the current financial year, with a further budget of Fresh Start funding of £19.1 million for the Struhl Shared Education Campus, agreed and, and agreed shared and integrated uh, school project. Smaller investment at a larger number of schools continues to be delivered through the Minor Works Capital Programme, for which, Mr Speaker, I have agreed a budget of £64 million in this uh, financial year. I also continue to recognise the most valued education and development of our young people being delivered uh, in non-school settings through youth programmes throughout the country, and have ring-fenced a budget of £10 million for capital works for youth centres. In delivering across these programmes, I am also conscious of my department's wider environmental responsibilities. I am aware of the emerging regulations aimed at bringing our public buildings to near zero emissions, and accordingly, uh, following my statement today, I shall instruct my officials to examine how best practice in this regard can be reflected into the design and delivery of the projects I will announce shortly. My delivery teams in, uh, in both the department and its arm's length bodies continue to work hard to progress projects across all of these programmes. However, the time required to develop any major capital project from concept through to actual build means that sufficient projects must be advanced to the point where they could effectively utilise funds that may be available in the future. Therefore, in addressing the needs of uh, needs for much greater capital investment across the school's estate, I must ensure that I have sufficient uh, announced projects at an early development stage to ensure that uh, capital budgets uh, available to me can be utilised to the greatest extent. Rather than congest the early stage delivery pipeline with a large number of projects, it is therefore my intention to make modest but more frequent announcements uh, on capital to ensure that those projects announced have gained uh, real traction before the next announcement is made. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, following my announcement today, I intend to ask my officials to commence preparation for a further call for project nominations later in the year to facilitate a further announcement in 2021. This will facilitate those schools that are in need of a major capital works but have either not scored highly enough on this occasion to feature in, in this announcement or did not satisfy the gateway requirements, but shall do so in the future uh, following, uh, for example, the outworking of a statutory development proposal to either rationalise or amalgamate. For this reason, I have decided to announce nine new major capital projects with an estimated capital uh, in the region of £156 million. 
An announcement on this scale means that there is sufficient delivery capacity to ensure that work can continue on previously announced projects, while also allowing these additional projects to be moved forward at pace. Uh, Mr Temporary Speaker, I, uh, I take the selection of major capital works projects to advance in design very seriously, as effectively it is a competitive process. It is therefore critical that the process used to select projects uh, is documented and, more importantly, followed. This has been achieved across the last number of years through the development of a protocol for the selection of projects to advance in design, and the same process has been utilised on this occasion. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I do not intend to go into this protocol in great detail, but in brief, Mr. Derek Baker, the Department's Permanent Secretary, launched a call for major works projects in September 2019 for primary and post primary uh, schools. By the closing date of uh, the 31st of October 2019, a total of 89 eligible applications were lodged by, schools, uh, by school managing authorities and sectoral bodies. The applications lodged were assessed in line with the protocol for the 2019-20 Major Works Call for Projects, which was agreed and published on the Department's website uh, in advance of the launch of the call. A gateway check was undertaken to ensure that the schools, which were to be considered for major capital investment, were viable and sustainable, and that there was certainty with regard to the school's development and that schools had not been announced to receive major capital funding under the second school enhancement programme. The gateway check resulted in 21 schools being ruled out of further consideration. The remaining 68 schools were ranked in merit based upon a scoring system, which again was detailed in the protocol, and separate uh, prioritised lists were drawn up for primary schools and post-primary schools. In deciding the number of schools to announce under the major capital uh, programme, I consider the capital budget required to build these schools, the Department's current capital works programme and the capacity of the resources required to develop and deliver the project. I understand that there are many competing budget pressures at this time, and the current COVID-19 outbreak has had a significant impact on resource budgets. However, it is important to look to the future and give, uh, give some much-needed good news, not just for schools and the wider school communities, but also for the contractors and the professionals in the uh, construction industry and indeed the wider economy, which will benefit financially from this announcement. Whilst construction spent on these projects is not likely to commence until the 2024-25 financial year, making this announcement today will ensure a steady pipeline of projects in design, which in turn will ensure the continued modernisation of the school's estate in future years as these projects move to construction. Mr Speaker, I wish now to turn to the list of major works projects to be advanced in design. I am today announcing nine projects to advance uh, in design, and these schools will benefit from a total estimated capital investment of £156 million. The list comprises three primary schools and six post-primary schools. The three primary schools brought forward in design are Holy Trinity Primary in Skillen, St Catherine's Primary School Straban, St Mary's Primary School uh, Craigavon, and the six post-primary schools to be brought forward in design are All Saints College Belfast, Blessed Trinity College Belfast, St Connors College Kil, uh, Kilray, St Louis Grammar School Kilkeel, St Patrick's College uh, Makara, and Tandragee Junior High School Tandragee. Mr Speaker, it is important to recognise that many schools in the estate are old and as such are costly to maintain and others are not operating with sufficient pupil numbers to provide the uh, optimum learning environment as recommended by Bain. And so we must, there must be careful consideration as to how funding that is available is invested. By focusing on area planning and investing in schools which are viable and sustainable uh, will help us all in this endeavour. The schools which have been announced today have, uh, have met these criteria. In making this announcement today, it is my intention that these projects uh, would, have taken, uh, would be taken through to construction. However, I stress that authorisation to proceed to construction on any individual project will be based upon the level of capital funding available at the point when the design is complete and when all necessary approvals have been secured. I recognise that today's announcement will be good news for some and disappointing for many others. For those who have not been successful in their application today, I would advise them that it is my intention to make uh, smaller, more frequent announcements of major capital projects. This approach will ensure that schools which are currently subject to area planning considerations will be better placed to apply under the next major capital works call for projects. 
Uh, finally, I would reaffirm that my department's strategy for capital investment in the coming years will continue to be shaped by the uh, outworking of area planning and the delivery of a modern, fit-for-purpose estate of viable and sustainable schools. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I call the Chairperson of the Education Committee, Mr Chris Little. Thank you, uh, Temporary Speaker. I thank the Minister for her statement today. Can I also use this as an opportunity to continue to thank our teachers across Northern Ireland for their hard work, dedication and innovation during this public health emergency uh, and for continuing to work well beyond the contracted hours uh, to achieve a return to education in Northern Ireland. Uh, we welcome this investment, um, but I imagine that most MLAs in this Assembly will be deeply concerned at reports today of a dispute between the DUP and Sinn Féin delaying investment in free school meals and I understand quite possibly childcare as well. Can the Minister uh, update this Assembly as to why there has been a delay in delivering that investment in free school meals and childcare and ensure that a, a political dispute will not put further to delay to that vital investment? Join with the, the member. Thank him for his, his, some of his comments. And I would join, I think, in not only thanking those you know, <coughs> teaching workforce in the current situation, but also there are many non-teaching staff who have helped deliver uh, over the, the last few months and they will continue to deliver. Uh, look, let me make it clear. I mean, I think the, the question largely, I think, uh, was somewhat tangential, I suppose, to the statement. Um, but it's clear that we want to see uh, a resolution to all budget issues, including the issue of victims' uh, pension. Mm -hmm. That will be something that will be progressed. And I think that uh, there is common consent around the issue, particularly of, of uh, the free school meals. And I'm confident that that will be something that uh, will be progressed to ensure that uh, we will have that level of provision uh, for our vulnerable children across the, um, uh, across the piece. Particularly on free school meals, it has been a situation in Northern Ireland both the level of funding and indeed the level of coverage of the number of children has been much greater than in other parts of the United Kingdom. That's something I welcome and I look forward to resolution to all those issues. Call William Humphrey. Thank you for his statement to the House today and I welcome the investment uh, particularly in Blessed Trinity College which is the merger of Little Flower and St Patrick's in North Belfast and, and certainly that school could do with the investment so I welcome that. Um, I thank the Minister for his work, ongoing work and support uh, of education and decisions he's making in very difficult times. Uh, can I also thank him for the time taken to visit the boys model a couple of weeks ago and I know we'll visit the girls model later this week. Can I ask the Minister particularly with Seaview Primary School that I've mentioned to him before in North Belfast which needs a new school urgently. Can I ask the Minister, will there be any further announcements made uh, around school capital development in this tranche? Yeah, as, uh, I thank the, Minister, uh, the Member for his, his comments. Uh, yes, the, the intention would be, and I know that he has been lobbying on a number of projects, and particularly uh, Seaview, and has been a strong supporter of the school. It, it is the case that I think it is important that we keep a, a pipeline of, uh, of projects going. So therefore, it would be my intention that in 2021 to make another call uh, that will mean look, inevitably that on any capital announcement, those schools that receive will be very happy, those who don't will be disappointed, and in some cases, some of those schools will have been fairly high up on the, uh, on the list. I'm not going to mention particular schools um, in relation to that. So therefore, there will be an opportunity um, that uh, in 2021 there will be a further call that will be made, and the intention will be to try to make sure that we have a number of calls, uh, of, and therefore perhaps smaller announcements on occasions. There have been other announcements uh, where there's been a larger number of schools and a longer gap uh, between uh, those calls. I want to make sure that all schools are treated fairly and given that opportunity. So uh, Seaview, indeed, other schools that have not been successful in this particular call will have that opportunity at the next call, and it will be uh, in 2021. Uh, before I call the next uh, speaker, could I remind uh, members um, to speak into the microphone and speak through the chair because the answer, Hansard and other members won't be picking up the, uh, uh, the, the, the comments you are making. I call Karen Mullen. I thank the Minister for his statement. Um, this is very much welcome news for the successful schools today. But Minister, there will be many in my city disappointed today um, after this announcement, in particular the Irish medium sector. We have three Irish medium schools in the city. Um, operating in so-called so temporary accommodation who, who have been operating for a period of between 15 and 30 years. You're aware of their situation and in your statement it is therefore 
you state it is therefore essential that any capital investment is targeted at supporting the delivery of modern fit for purpose schools that are both viable and, and sustainable into the future. So Minister, can I ask that you would come to Derry and meet with these schools to discuss their needs and outline the process? Thank you, Member, for a question. Look, I'm, I'm happy to meet with anybody to outline the uh, process in relation to it. The position has been, obviously, that in terms of applications, uh, there were 81 schools that had applied, 68 then, uh, sorry, 89 applied, 68 then made the, made the gateway check. By doing so, all 68 of those are investable from that point of view. Uh, there will be a limitation on resources, and one of the restrictions that is there is that something could be done many times over. Now, uh, across that this was an announcement in terms of a scheme that was announced in 2019. It was scored according to the criteria and the protocol that were in existence um, at that point. Uh, that is something which is done directly and fairly according to those objective criteria. Uh, and it will mean that at times different sectors on individual announcements may have different levels of, of success. Uh, you know, I'm committed to try to ensure not only that, that schools, as much as possible where it's needed, will get that new school build. But if there's actions across the board in individual circumstances which can be taken to ensure that if there's inadequate uh, provisions, whether there's something that can be done temporarily in any particular school will be looked at. And I think that's one of the things that will be borne in mind, particularly as we move ahead into the, the autumn, to try to make sure that we maximise uh, the number of children who are directly into the, the classroom. But I'm, I'm more than happy to meet with um, anybody from any sector to try and explain uh, what the situation is. But inevitably, in announcing successful schools, there will be a much greater pool of schools that have been unsuccessful. And that is not because they were without merit. It's because in terms of the ranking according to the criteria, they didn't uh, reach, they weren't ranked ahead of some other schools, which have then been ranked to, um, to reach uh, those that have been able to be announced today. I call Daniel McCrossum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, and Minister, thank you also for your statement. And uh, for once today, I'll be thanking you very, very uh, uh, happily for the announcement in relation to Straban. Uh, this will be welcome news, particularly for the principal, Mrs. Bridget Wilders, her team, and also the many families across Straban that have long awaited this new build and advancement of the project. 470 pupils, uh, Minister, are awaiting this, so it's welcome news today. Minister, many schools across the entirety of Northern Ireland and, uh, and my constituency are very anxious about the return to school, which uh, your department are working on. What investment or what plans are in place to ensure the necessary infrastructure is in place to ensure the safety of staff and pupils within the school environment? For instance, uh, a lot of discussion has been not just about class sizes, but class room sizes. What happens in the situation where a small school can't accommodate uh, even with one metre distance uh, between pupils uh, within the classroom? Will there be provision for extra space and will it be financed by the Department or EA? We are working, and I know that the Finance Minister is also keen to be supportive where possible. If there are practical solutions which can be provided, uh, and I suppose one of the constraints on that, particularly if we are looking at capital, is there can't always be a very quick turnaround in relation to it. Uh, can I state, I suppose, first of all, my aim is to reach a point, and I would hope that this would be, and we are in a rapidly developing situation, which enables everybody to be back uh, in place this autumn. Uh, all the time. That will be dependent upon the wider medical and scientific situation, but it has not been something uh, which in that sense is in any way given up or abrogated. Uh, can I say that, that what will be the case in terms of the guidance that has been issued, for some schools they will be able to do that, for uh, many others the constraints that are there in terms of space will at present, if we are in a situation in which the current environment is still there, they will not be able to do that. So the guidance is given uh, at present to a, um, a situation in which the, the effort is to try to maximise space and to maximise the numbers. In doing so, if there are any temporary solutions which can be put in place which will aid that, I think that uh, that is something to be taken into account. I think it is also the case, and indeed the paper that was put forward to the executive, which I will be seeking, if you like, wider support as well. I think there is also a challenge that is out there and this may be more in terms of providing locations where there can be supervised learning, but also which can be used as well. If there is also assistance and help that can be given by the voluntary sector, the community sector, by 
church organised churches or a range of other bits where additional space can be on a temporary basis provided. You know, I think this should be an opportunity for the community to pull together to try to provide that. And we will work with schools to try and provide and maximise their opportunities in terms of space. And that will be ongoing work over the, the weeks to come. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you very much, Minister, for your statement. Thank you. Uh, Minister, in relation to these new bills and new schools, can I also welcome, I see, the, for Holy Trinity Primary School in Enniskillen, and indeed uh, welcome 19 million for the integrated, the new, the new integration, integration schools project in OMA, because a lot of pupils from Fermanagh South Tyrone are educated in OMA. So I'd like to thank you for both those. I would, I would like to know, given the way forward, to sort of follow on from um, Mr. McCrossan's question. We're, we've gone through a pandemic with COVID-19. What is the future planning in relation to our, the sizes of our school, room, our school classrooms, etc.? I know the specific instructions when schools are being drawn up, when school build is from new. What is the future? Do, are we? Are you intending perhaps having school class sizes made, school classroom sizes made larger to accommodate perhaps social distancing, if it has to be in the future? I think it's important that, that it, whatever we do is, is future-proofed in that regard. Although we can't always simply just react to the, the precise set of circumstances. The, the position, which is always something that is kept under review, is that whenever schools have been built um, in recent days, recent years. Um, they are built to handbook specifications in terms of size. I think where the problem lies within, and that has meant that particularly, for instance, within the primary sector, schools of a particular size, which tend to be 60 square metres or above in that regard. Um, in doing so, I think where the bigger problem lies, it is not on what has been built in recent years. It is a reflection sometimes of the historic situation, and we will find for instance, I think roughly about a third of classrooms are 50 metres or below. So the problem is probably not on the basis of the specifications that are there uh, for any new builds or indeed those that have been recently built. It's more, if you like, dealing with the historic uh, situation, but always in terms of what the best specifications for um, handbook is always something that will be kept under review to, to ensure that we've got something that is fit for purpose. Call John Bonnet. I welcome this statement from the Minister and indeed his strategic vision and commitment to the ongoing uh, improvement of the learning environment for Northern Ireland's children. I'd like to draw his attention to his statement where he mentions £10 million being ring-fenced for capital works with regard to youth centres, and I'd be grateful if he would expand on the detail regarding that. But I'd also like to draw his attention to the fact that, th that these buildings are dependent on the projects and the, the pupils who will fill them still being ex in existence in circumstances where there is a dearth of funding overall. And I would like some reassurance for the Minister that, that I, I'm certain he's cognizant of it, but I would like some uh, reassurance from him that he is giving consideration to these issues because he will certainly be aware of the very good work that goes on with our young people outside of the school curriculum. Thank you. No, undoubtedly, I, I, it is undoubtedly the case that um, while there's very good work that happens within schools, that is also supplemented, particularly by those involved, both formally, particularly through youth service, but also through a range of organisations, and I think particularly of voluntary um, youth organisations, I think of some of the uniformed organisations, I think of a range of settings where actually in a practical point of view there is that, that level of delivery, uh, which was why I was keen, and I know it's on a slightly different subject, that, for instance, as we look ahead towards the summer, that in addition to what is done officially through youth service, that also there is a broad permission given to organisations, uh, provided that they follow the public health advice, to be able to, to take action over the, the summer. In, in terms of the, the 10 million, I think uh, it is on the basis that, that youth centres are on a slightly different basis from schools, and it would be unfair to be comparing sort of um, apples to pears if, if essentially they were all bundled in together. So that's why there's been a level of, of uh, separate provision. And indeed, I know um, when I had accompanied, I think, a, a couple of the members from this House to a, a number of school visits up in uh, the North West um, a number of months ago, it concluded then with uh, a 
visit to one of the youth centres, which I think is progressing in terms of, uh, I think the official announcement was made in terms of the work ongoing in connection with that and would be, would be replaced. So there's a, there's a critical role that would be there uh, in terms of uh, youth service. In terms of longer term provision, it, yes, it is the case that it is on the basis of ensuring that there are pupils to fill the places. That is why, I mean, a number of years ago, I suppose going back um, over a decade ago, whenever it was probably felt that, that there was a, uh, a fairly open amount of, of money that simply would go on and on, uh, there was a number of capital announcements or indeed provision made uh, without really a, a, the same level of provision in terms of ensuring that it was compliant, that it was future-proofed. Uh, that is why, as part of any process, the gateway check is there to try to make sure that, um, uh, that the schools are going to be something that meet with area planning. Now, uh, as time moves on, there is probably likely to be some level of change to gateway checks because there will be some um, schools that are perhaps, for example, failing to make that because of a certain level of artificial barrier in terms of their numbers. Sometimes that reflects a, a historical enrolment side of it. But it is the case, therefore, that anything that is being announced is then on the basis of something that is sustainable into the future. And that gateway check, therefore, becomes critical to make sure that we are not potentially pouring money into a school which then may not have a, a future five or ten years down the road. Uh, and I thank the Minister for her statement. And I'm absolutely delighted, I have to say, to see the inclusion of St Louis Grammar School in, Kink in Kilkeel. The, the Minister will know my persistence in that regard in terms of ensuring that there is uh, financial investment in, the, uh, in St Louis and the wider uh, Mourne area. And I really can't think of another school that's more deserving. Um, and as someone who's worked closely with St Louis and the Board of Governors, um, I know that they will, will today be, be absolutely thrilled um, to be included in today's announcement. Um, this investment is absolutely necessary and it's absolutely justified and it will allow the much needed new school build to uh, proceed at pace um, and it will ensure uh, the continued educational excellence um, and the viability of education in the morns. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of the process and the next step for schools, I wonder if the Minister could, could outline that for us. And you know, I would certainly extend an invitation to, to the Minister to come to, to, come to Kilkeel, uh, meet with the teaching staff and the Board of Governors and just, uh, discuss the, the next steps in that process with them. Be very much welcome. Thank you. Member for uh, for her observations. I mean, it's probably the case that I suspect across the chamber um, there will be at least 18 different views on what is the most deserving school project uh, that should be at the top of any list, which is why there needs to be always objective criteria. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to be um, down in Kilkeel or indeed other places. I did uh, recently on a visit uh, to Newry as part of that. I think meet with all the post-primary principals in, in the broader sort of. Uh, Newry, parts of South Down area, including, I think, representatives from Kilkeel. I think there was probably somebody there from St Louis at that. In terms of processes, then, the next step will be to work through the business case and do a level of um, uh, feasibility study. That will make sure that what is being put forward is fit for purpose, that if, in most cases, it will be a direct new build, but if there is a slightly different solution that will be done. Major capital works, by their nature, will tend to um, will take longer than other types of capital works, in part because one of the issues that will be also have to be done, there will be a project board in each case that will be established. Uh, and part of the, and where, for example, they would differ from school enhancement programmes, not just on basis in terms of scale, but as part of this, there will then be a level of site search. So uh, a number of areas will be scoped out within the local area to establish what is the best location in terms of particularly value for public money and what will be fit for purpose. That will inevitably mean that these things tend to take a bit, bit longer. But um, as with, I suppose, um, there will not be, even in current circumstances, a level of barrier to that. And again, we're all living in a slightly more virtual world that we would have been a few months ago. And all those issues will be able to be commenced. So it will follow, if you like, standard procedure. But again, I'd be happy to meet with representatives of the school at some stage. Call Paul Frew. Can I ask, what is the breakdown in spending across uh, all these schools that have been successful today? And can the Minister also enlighten the House as to the differences between the School Enhancement Programme and the Major Capital Works Programme? Okay, the, the breakdown, I think there will be individual budgets that are tentatively set aside. So it's, it will be, roughly speaking, I think, the bulk of them, because they tend to be sort of a, of a much greater um, scale. 
Roughly speaking, we're looking at around about 20 million on the primary side of it for the three schools and the remainder of the budget being spent on the post-primary side of it. But those will adjust a little bit as we move into feasibility and business study cases. In terms of the school enhancement programme, I suppose there are two major differences which then lead to a consequential um, change. Firstly, I suppose that there is an upper limit of £4 million in terms of the school enhancement programme. Major capital works are pitched then above that. The school enhancement programme also then has a minimum level of investment of half a million pounds. Um, uh, the other issue is that school enhancement programme is essentially to take an existing building and by its nature enhance it. So it may well be that uh, there would be an additional sports hall that is built, there may be a science block or something of that nature. But by its nature, it will involve effectively work happening on site. Now, it is not with a major capital works there will be an examination of what the best site effectively to rebuild a, a new school. On some occasions, that will mean actually a, a build which takes place on the same site as the existing school, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, whereas a school enhancement programme will always take place uh, on site. That means, if you like, that the speed of turnaround because it's both in terms of size and the fact that, that it takes, if you like, a major element out of the, uh, the process, will mean that school enhancement programmes typically will actually be delivered at a lot quicker pace than a major capital project. I call Keith Archibald. Um, and I, I thank the Minister for his statement and, and I welcome that St Connors and Kilway, which is in, in my constituency, uh, is one of the, the post primaries that have benefited from investment to advance in design. Um, I also welcome that the design and delivery of these bills will be based on net zero emissions, so that, that's very welcome. In terms of the, the ten million that has been ring fenced, and the, the previous member has addressed this as well, in terms of the youth centres. When can you expect announcements around that to be made, and is this, will they be included in, in this process, or is there a complete new process required for those projects? Graham Ogut. Well, in terms of the, the exact timescales, I can certainly get back to the member on that. It is, in many ways, a separate project, and quite often the nature of the scale, particularly of youth centres, will tend to be of a smaller nature than obviously a major capital build with schools. That is why it is kept, if you like, at a, at a separate side of it and also on the basis that, as again, it is not comparing like with like, so it would be dealt with in a separate way. Will the Minister join with me in applauding our principals, teachers, school staff, parents and pupils for the roles whose roles have been completely reconfigured and who have had to make the best out of very difficult and challenging circumstances. Minister, I welcome the statement today and the continued investment in our school and states. I particularly welcome the inclusion of Tandragui High School and I especially welcome the commencement on site of St Joseph's High School in Cross Glen. Can I ask the Minister, will he update the House on the proposed new builds at St Peter's College Land and St Malagy's Armagh, both of which were announced in March 2016? Thank the member. I, I'm, first of all, I'm happy to join in the, uh, the thanks that is out there, as I said to both, as I indicated to the chair, both the teaching and non-teaching staff. But also, I think we should be thanking the role that's been played by parents and also by students who've been left at times in a very difficult uh, situation, particularly younger children who must be wondering at times what is going on out there. So I, I would certainly be happy to uh, congratulate in relation to that. In terms of the specifics of those two projects. Um, do not have the detail directly at hand, but I will be happy to write to the, the member with the detail uh, in terms of those two specific projects. I call Robbie Butler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Temporary Speaker. I thank the Minister for his announcements today. And whilst none of them extend to Lagan Valley, I join in the, the, the thanks that everybody has said from their respective uh, areas for the schools that have benefited at this stage. You did talk, Minister, about emerging regulations aimed at bringing our public buildings to a near zero. Uh, net emissions um, uh, target, which is appropriate, ambitious and commendable. But I would like to have heard a line uh, about uh, therapeutic design. And that, 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 when we talk to young people, the number one issue they talk about is mental ill health. And schools and the school environment has a major part to play. What I would have liked to have heard was a commitment towards a zero suicide focused design. Um, could, the, could the minister give us a commitment today that that is indeed the case? And it was just omitted from the, the, the line. Everything will always be tried to be done in terms of uh, mental health. I think I'm, I'm conscious that in terms of what can be promised, um, all of us have the ambition to see zero suicides, if we can eliminate that. 
I think that while there is a contribution in terms of the environment that can be put, it's, it's a much wider issue than, than simply what is there in terms of school buildings. One of the things that has struck me is that, that in terms of design, um, designs that have been put in place, and uh, to be fair, if you go back to schools, which even in the last decade or so, uh, from visiting school buildings, you will see a consideration of the impact um, in terms of the broader mental health environment, which I think has been put into place in terms of designs that have been there for quite a period of time. So if you go to a school that is, say, roughly 10 years old, you will see much greater use of space, much greater use of light, and in terms of the atmosphere that that automatically, I think, creates within the school is conducive, um, I think, both to uh, helping, if you like, with the broad schooling, but also, I think, in terms of mental health. So that, that is part of the broad, the broad process, and I think that in terms of design, there is much more imagination that is there, there is much more thinking that is, is going on, particularly around, for instance, simply use of windows, use of open spaces, which create that much sort of better atmosphere. But buildings can take us so far, there is a range of other interventions which all of us know need to happen, and I think are happening to some extent, but we need to make sure that they are, uh, they are there. That's why, for instance, in terms of this year's budget, I've given uh, and it remains to be seen whether there's further assistance to be done by the COVID side of it, but really prior to that, I was keen to commit a level of additional spend in terms of mental health, uh, particularly focused in at primary schools, which to some extent have maybe been the poor relation of that level of funding, uh, but there is additional resources this year, and I think that's something which we tackle not just within the school system, but in a, a wider context as well, and a job for all of us. I call Gordon Dunn. Mr. Temporary, temporary Speaker, and thank the Minister for his announcement today on the investment is really welcome in a in, in new build. Does the Minister recognise and has the Minister any ideas of further opportunities for investment in our schools, especially in the North Town area, when we think of the Bangor Central School that's long awaited for such an announcement, which you're very much aware of, Mr Minister? In terms of detail, I mean, obviously Bangor Central is part of the Fresh Start money, so it is happening. It's a matter, as uh, is often the case, particularly with major capital announcements, it does take a while to go through processes, but I can give the member an absolute assurance that Bangor Central uh, and indeed a number of other projects uh, are happening. Uh, also, I know in terms of priority, for instance, with part of that, yeah, I, I know that the member may be very keen to slip a couple of additional schools into the announcement today, but it is, I suppose, ultimately what it is on that, on that basis. And there will be a mixture. I think it is important that in terms of getting this right, there will be a mixture of major capital announcements, and as part of that, I want to create a, a mix throughout the period, but also a school enhancement programme, because that can also be sometimes the solution which is needed as well as other aspects of um, maintenance, or sorry, of minor works. And also, even despite circumstances, there has been able to be a small increase in the maintenance budget this year, because to some extent as well, if we can head off problems um, prior to the, them happening, I think that that is also something that would be welcome. I call Catherine Kelly. Girl Mayo Goodlass, Ken Corlea. Thank you, Minister, for your statement. I'm very glad to see St Catherine's Primary School and Straban included um, on this and the work, the plans going forward. I also welcome uh, the further commitments made in relation to Stroul. Can I ask, Minister, do, what does today's announcement mean for the Stroul project going forward in terms of the delivery of the campus? In terms, of, in terms of detail, it's obviously confirming up that there is within capital budget that there will be further work will be done uh, this year. Uh, obviously, unfortunately, I think because of the particular circumstances in Seoul, there was a level of disruption that has been caused by the, the uh, COVID intervention. That has knocked things back a little bit. But obviously, Seoul is the biggest single investment uh, that education has put into place in any one site may even be one of the biggest levels of investment that the executive of the whole has ever put in. So it's, it's absolute key priority. In terms of obviously the direct reference to the nine schools, that doesn't directly impact on Stroul, but it's, it's a clear indication of the direction of travel that there is that ongoing commitment uh, to Stroul. Uh, I had um, the great honour along uh, with the then um, First Minister and Deputy First Minister uh, of visiting Arvalee whenever it was opened as the first element of that, and I look forward to seeing the other, school, the other schools on campus being opened as well. I call Kelly Armstrong. 
Thank you, temporary, temporary speaker. Seems quite strange to say that, but it's good to see you sitting up there. That's a different way to look at this place. Um, thank you very much, Minister, for your statement. Um, and just talking about Strill, um, you confirm in your statement a further 19 point million, 19.1 million pounds for Strool and shared and integrated education. Um, further, the dictionary definition is additional. Um, given that Fresh Start is a fixed budget, is this more money? If the Minister could break down how that 19.1 million is going to be spent, and if Strool is acce accessing the majority of that amount, um, is that part of the plan spend on Strool, or is this more money going out of Fresh Start to one project? Um, and if the Minister is able to access further funding, further capital funding, what money is he planning to spend to facilitate necessary space for the Educational Restart Programme? Right. Um, in terms of the, the situation, obviously we've been working with colleagues in terms of any additional support which can be there, particularly on a temporary basis in terms of restart. Um, in terms of, I suppose, it's ultimately an issue of the profiling of it. The, the aim and the, one of the restrictions that was put on Fresh Start, and the member will be only too aware of this, initially in terms of what was provided by Treasury was very much a ring-fenced situation where a particular amount of money could own that, if you like, you missed out. You didn't get that in that particular year. We've been able to get that level of flexibility, I should say, maybe wearing a, a different hat initially through the confidence and supply arrangement, but one that has been honoured, I think, by government as well. So it's about ensuring that we make uh, all of the money that's available in Fresh Start that is delivered within uh, that period of time. And consequently, that will mean a level of reprofiling stuff, stuff being brought forward at times, uh, some st stuff, but the, the aim, because there's a considerable level of support that is there across the 500 million, is to make sure that we get everything spent within that, within the time uh, constraint. Call Paul Given. Bigger. Um, I know today there will be schools, um, and rightly very pleased with the outcome, but uh, I have to say, Minister, the people in Dromore will be extremely disappointed with this decision. A school of over 1,000 children, a canteen that can only serve half of them, no disability access. Uh, they have to access sports facilities from outside their own uh, precincts, uh, and an expectation that that school needs to have a new build. What assurances can the Minister give that in the next call that the criteria that is used will, will not disadvantage schools like Dromore, which are not able to merge with any other school within their vicinity because they are already at capacity and bursting at the seams? I would make uh, two points. I know I will be visiting Dromore High uh, soon. First of all, criteria is always kept under review to try to make sure that, uh, as we move ahead, that for any future call that is, is done on as fair a basis as possible. What will also be the case, and I know that there's very strong needs of Dromore High, as indeed there are for a number of, of schools. I suppose the other thing that will be taken out of this will be because nine schools have got that green light, when it comes to the next call, they are effectively now out of the, out of the picture. They are more or less uh, will not be ahead of the queue, which means that whenever there's a, a further call that is made, whether it's on this or indeed other issues, it will give, I think, the level of natural opportunities to those schools that did miss out uh, today to have much greater opportunity then to uh, feature in that, that, that top number, because once it's a capital announcement made, that is effectively them uh, out of the picture. But I appreciate there will be a number of schools throughout Northern Ireland that will have not uh, been successful today. That is not to say they will not be successful in the future. Uh, the, committee, the Business Committee is arranged to meet at 1 p.m. today on a proposed hour for by leave of the Assembly to suspend this sitting until 2 p.m. The first uh, item of business will be a continuation of question time here, and the first person speaking will be Sinead Bradley. The sitting is by leave suspended. Okay, members, we're going to uh, resume uh, and questions to the Minister. And, uh, I call Sinead Bradley. Mr. Temporary Speaker, and I hope that's the correct title. <laughs> um, I want to thank the Minister for his statement today, particularly once it's in, it, it, because it includes the long awaited St. Louis Grammar School in Kilkeel. Um, I did have a chance during our break to have engagement with the Vice Chair of the Board of Governors, Brenton Cunningham. And to say he and the principal, Kevin Martin, are ecstatic is beyond um, anything that I could describe. But the staff, the governors, are absolutely delighted today's announcement. I welcome the minister's statement also about ensuring that all future buildings are future-proofed to fit the green agenda. I would also ask the minister 
what consideration or assurance can you give that it's also future-proofed buildings to provide a wide curriculum and educational offer? And what I have in mind here, particularly to the St Louis site, is the need for the inclusion of a junior school, a vocational school, um, modern special educational needs provision and upper sixth capacity. It's, it's, I'm always glad when I can make somebody ecstatic in this chamber, uh, albeit remotely. Um, can I say that in terms of, and I, I wonder just if, if we're to meet all the demands that uh, the Honourable Member suggests it may absorb the whole £156 million. Uh, I'm sure she'd be happy enough if that was all spent in Kilkeel on that basis. But all, all school bills will be entirely fit for purpose and they will cover the full range of potential in terms of the, um, the entitlement framework. It is also the case that uh, there will be work in terms of precisely what is needed. Uh, there will then be a process of feasibility uh, study and business case, and there will be working between officials um, and the school to actually see what is precisely needed in terms of a new build and the uh, capital works. So uh, I'll give her that assurance that that, that will carry on, and I'm, I'm glad that at least the people of Kilkeel then will be happy tonight in relation to uh, the new build in, in St Louis. I call John O'Dowd. I would previously and call you and take the opportunity to congratulate you on your elevation to this post. Um, I just want to firstly thank the Minister for bringing the statement forward. It's welcome for all the schools involved, uh, particularly St Mary's uh, in Lachnagall on the shores of Loch Ness, and I'm sure it'll be good news for them. But uh, the Minister will be aware that from announcing a school to getting a school built can take several years. Uh, and despite the best work of, of, of people in the department who have, have first hand experience of both in the department and outside of it, driving those processes forward. Would the Minister agree with me that the Executive collectively need to come forward with a mechanism which delivers public building programmes much quicker than we currently do? I think there's a for all of us in terms of that. And I suppose it's also balancing out where we need to ensure that there is also then value for public money. Because I think particularly as regards where it's major capital works, one of the key aspects of that will be ensuring that um, there is, for instance, a site search as part of that to make sure that that we're, it's on the most appropriate land, that it's the best value for money for land. But I mean, look, I, the member, I think, makes a valid point in terms of, uh, broadly speaking, in a, in a wider context of public works to try to make sure they're done as timely as, as, as possible. Part of this is to try to ensure, indeed, why there'll be regular announcements, is to ensure that there's a pipeline of, of activity. And I think that will be of significance both to, um, in any individual case, the school itself to see that built uh, as soon as possible, but also in terms of the pipeline and ensuring that we don't have undue delays within the system is critical also to the wider economic situation as regards to the construction industry. Uh, and it's undoubtedly the case, I mean, as a, as a body, they, they suffered a level of disruption at the, as a minimum um, because of the, the COVID crisis. And I think that uh, both from that point of view of ensuring that jobs are maintained within that, but also actually that they become a, a key driver to the, um, uh, the economy, I think that uh, that is also critical, and I will be happy to work, indeed, along with a range of other colleagues, obviously, particularly when it comes to issues around procurement, etc., uh, with particularly the finance minister, as whose overall most control of the, the broader brush of, of construction, to try to make sure that, that uh, we move ahead as, as quickly as possible with any of these projects. I call Pat Chigan. Thanks to the Minister for her statement. I want to welcome uh, the fact that the All Saints College in West Belfast is on the list. Uh, All Saints is an amalgamation of three schools in West Belfast, St Rose's, Corpus Christi and Glen Road CBS. And it's currently split across two different sites, uh, quite a distance apart, I might add. Uh, and uh, land has to be identified for a new build because it's believed neither site is big enough to facilitate the new college. And uh, I just want to ask the minister, is, is the funding going to be available in the long term while this site is developed and the new school actually built? Yeah, no, look, anything that we're, that's being announced in terms of new build will happen. From that point of view, obviously, as indicated, one of the key roles of any project board within uh, an individual school build will actually be that identification of what is the best land, what is the most suitable, uh, what is also the best from the point of view of a public uh, purse point of view. So those will all be balanced out uh, and uh, move forward on. But um, in terms of while there is always in that broader level 
uh, uncertainty as regards future budgets, particularly in terms of the capital budget, because that can roll, it's likely to roll forward for a number of years. There is always, I think, a level of confidence um, that, uh, uh, that that will be available. And I suppose um, that is why also there's a, I would say, a certain extent of a cautious approach. It's probably trying to get the balance right, because in theory, you know, we could have come and announced 20 projects, but there wouldn't be necessarily the funding for it. So the idea is that anything that's being announced, whether it's through major capital works or whether it's through, for instance, the school enhancement programme, is therefore on a, on a rolling process which enables then uh, those sort of costs to be met and indeed that there is finance that would be for it. And I think we can do that with a, a level of confidence. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Minister, for your statement. And I do welcome your statement saying that you're conscious of the Department's wider environmental responsibilities. But I would like to ask the Minister to outline what you mean by the emerging regulations aimed at this and by what best, best practice actually looks like reflected into the design and delivery of the projects. Are you looking at passive house for energy efficiency, for example? And if I may, um, further to Ms. Bunting's question on youth service and summer provision. Can the Minister confirm if activities can go on ahead face-to-face -face while adhering to current health guidelines? In, in relation to that, the detail, obviously ensuring something is environmentally sound and indeed within a wider context is of an appropriate design, contains obviously a number of things. Mentions been made earlier, for example, I think in relation to the question Mr Butler asked in terms of ensuring that we have an environment which is also nurturing in terms of mental health. So it's, it's about getting a range of things uh, put together in connection with that. Specifically as regards uh, the issue of summer schemes, what has been said, I suppose, is on a number of different levels. So there will be particular actions, and this may be something that will be coming back to on Thursday whenever due to be a statement to the Ad Hoc Committee. Um, there will be a number of particular schemes that will be organised by uh, the EA directly through its youth service. So that will be particularly in involving a certain level of um, general schemes and interventions. Uh, it will also involve particularly uh, schemes around special schools and around at-risk children. But in addition to that, uh, the issue is that it has been agreed that voluntary community organisations, uniformed organisations, and indeed I think that would also apply to private organisations, if they are want to seek to run a summer scheme, I think the key test for that will simply be there is level of permissibility provided they follow the public health guidelines that are available at the, at the time. Guidance, I think, will be issued to any, any organisation looking to do that by the Education Authority. But it is actually to say that, that we are not standing provided um, whatever scheme is compatible with public health and does not in any way endanger public health, that as a department or indeed as an executive, we are not standing in the way of that and people can, can do that. And there will be many, I, I think a lot of, uh, and a, Hopefully, in terms of a lot of summer stuff, will tend to be outdoors in its nature. But I think there's also a critical element, both in terms of the contribution that can be made to our young people, but also given probably the very difficult circumstances a lot of young people have had for the last number of months, that can, during the summer, in a safe way, can actually have a, a level of release for them. And I think a lot of communities will want to embrace that. Thank you, Jim Allison. Thank you. I'm sure the Minister would caution against looking at these allocations in isolation, but it's difficult not to notice that it appears that eight of the nine successful applications are from the maintained sector. Can I ask him, was it a similar proportion of applications within the 68 schools that were considered? I thank the member for the, the question. I don't have a, a detailed breakdown of the 68. I should say as well there were 89 initially put in, 21 of which didn't make the, the gateway side of it. Look, let me make it clear. As we move forward, I will always try and make sure that any criteria that is used will be, um, will be fair, objective and educationally sound. Um, it is clear that, for example, there will be a choice sometimes made between schools as to whether they apply, for instance, for a major capital work apply for a school enhancement uh, programme. And what will be the outworking of that, I suppose, across a range of announcements uh, will, I think, show a, an indication that different sectors will get uh, sort of a, will have fair representation across that. It will mean, though, if you isolate it into any individual set of announcements, it may well be that on a particular set of announcements, there is a higher proportion in 
one sector than another. So I ask the members both to take a look at this, not simply on the basis of what has been announced today, but looking at the wider context within that. I think, if memory serves me right, from a couple of the most recent announcements on the School Enhancement Programme, there was a higher percentage of those um, proportionately would have been, say, from the control sector, on that sort of thing. So sometimes it's about where a choice, make, a choice is made by a school. But I will, in moving forward, ensure that, that fairness and objectivity is always at the heart of any decisions that are made in terms of capital spend by the department. I call Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A few weeks ago in this House, I raised concern at the teacher and union passion that we witness in England can make its way here. And it seems that the Minister's party colleagues have taken up that mantle of teacher and union passion, and they're working very hard on it, seemingly. Would the Minister take the opportunity today to disassociate himself from his colleagues' comments and actually praise and thank our education staff for working hard throughout the coronavirus crisis and for raising serious health and safety concerns at this time? From that point of view, I've already made it clear, I think, to two previous questioners, I think um, that not just in terms of teaching staff, non-teaching staff, parents and pupils all deserve credit for the action that has been uh, taken over the last uh, number of months and will continue in relation to that. As we have a few minutes uh, remaining, members, I'm going to give the opportunity if anybody wants to ask uh, supplementary questions, and if they do, could they uh, stand in their seats and indicate that they want to? No. Yes. William. Given that I apologise for missing the start of it. Um, in relation to, to fairness and equity, can I just take this opportunity of reminding the Minister he was to, to visit two primary schools in my constituency, Seaview and Glenwood, and uh, both schools needing new, new build. Glenwood, the conditions are appalling. It is the hub school for the Shankill, Seaview the hub school for the Shore Road area. And can I implore the Minister, when it comes to the next round of, 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 of uh, the next tranche of money of investment for major capital works in education, that these schools are considered very seriously. We cannot ask people to value education. We cannot talk about young Protestant males and, and, and valuing education, educational attainment, hard to reach communities, and not invest in good uh, state for schools. Very temporary speaker, I take on board very much what has been said. I hope to be able to visit a number of schools and the two that he's mentioned particularly. I know that he's been particularly assiduous in relation to those. Uh, all schools will be treated fairly in terms of their application. I think one of the slightly frustrating side of things, particularly as regards capital build, both in terms of, I suppose, the restrictions within uh, the wider sort of opportunities there are for construction, but in terms of budget, is that in many ways, if we were to meet the needs of all our pupils from a capital point of view, the capital budget could be spent several times over on that basis. But look, I, when it comes to any future um, call, everybody will start on an entirely a level playing field and given the opportunity to be able to apply and be evaluated. And I'm confident it's indicated that there will be um, the intention is in, in 2021 to do a new call to which all schools will be able to apply. And hopefully, again, we'll see further schools then be able to get that level of support that is needed for all its pupils. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, you spoke this morning about a number of schools. Obviously, that had got uh, are in the pro are in the process of getting money for various. Um, improvements. Can you give me an update on the new build for Enniskillen Royal Grammar School? Um, I'll be happy to. In terms of very specific cases, I'll be happy to, rather than try to give a, a short answer at this stage, we'll, we'll actually have a bit of correspondence directly with the, the member and give a detailed response in relation to it. Look, I think one of the other things I would say in, in the broader level on it, that is very encouraging, having been down, not at the Royal Grammar, but at a, another school in Enniskillen within the last couple of weeks, is actually seeing that construction is starting again and being sort of at that school, seeing where it's getting a new build, um, seeing sort of the staff on site actually continuing on with that, that new development in that regard. But as regards to these specifics for the Royal School uh, in Enniskillen, um, I'll supply detailed information to the, the member in connection with that. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Temporary Speaker. I'm not take too long. Uh, Minister, you 
mentioned earlier in your speech about zero emissions and potential new builds coming forward would be looking certainly towards that. Could I ask, other than zero emissions for environmental benefits, has there been a cost-benefit analysis made of the savings that schools could achieve through um, innovative ways to heat and light those buildings? I think we'll always try and ensure that whatever proposals are there are as efficient as possible, uh, which is both in terms of the emissions side of it, but also in energy efficiency side of it. And it is clear that uh, one of the advantages of new build and using, if you like, new technology, using efficiency in terms of space, is that actually it's able to um, provide it on a much more cost-effective basis. Uh, it's undoubtedly the case, I think, with schools that that can therefore create a certain level of efficiency. Now, at one level, maybe that shouldn't be too overestimated because um, if you take a look at what the general running costs of any school, whether it's the, the oldest school in the country or the world's most efficient school, um, that well over 90% in pretty much every school will be staff costs. So the amount uh, from a pure financial point of view um, will be of a limited value. However, the more that can be saved within the system in terms of energy efficiency, or reduced additional costs, uh, the more that that leaves available to the school budget to be able to apply directly into um, the teaching side of it in terms of the, the provision for the children. And that's, I think, something that all of us should have a, a strong support for and objective for. That concludes questions for the Minister. It's further consideration stage of the Housing Amendment Bill, and I call on the Minister for Communities, Ms. Carolyn E. Killen, 